As I was uh, pulling the uh, presentation together and uh, rapidly doing that yesterday, uh, it missed uh, some computer issues. I took it home last night to review, and uh, you will notice that there are a couple of references to Brookdale. So if you don't tell them, I won't. <laughs> and uh, maybe between now and next year, I'll get those corrected. But uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and get this uh, started this morning. And I've asked Leslie to talk to you uh, initially about some important forms uh, and uh, we need your cooperation and support on So, Leslie. Morning, Leslie, Resident Services Director. I wanted to inform you all, each year we pass out new forms uh, during hurricane season to make sure we're updated with your emergency contact information so that we are able to contact the appropriate people at the front desk in case of emergency. Also, you have your file or vials of life that are on your refrigerators that we keep up to date whenever things occur. Again, emergency services. Well, now we're putting the two together and keeping them at the front desk. So we have a new form. It's the resident health history form. It is four pages, so two pages front and back. We will be placing them in your mailbox tonight. There will be two if you are a couple that will be placed in your box. But this form will have your basic medical information, the history, as well as your emergency contact information, your hospital choice. But the biggest thing is your health history and your medications that are on there. You can put the location of where you keep your prescription bottles. You're welcome to give us a list and we can do our best to keep it updated. But again, your medical history is the biggest thing. These will then be face sheets at our front desk and will be kept on our computer. So they'll be security password protected and our front desk staff will print it out when emergency <coughs> services is here for you to take you out to the hospital. So these face sheets will give the paramedics all the information they need to make sure that they're giving you the care you need, going to the hospital that you prefer. So please fill these out to the best of your ability uh, and handwriting that we can read so that I can enter into the computer. And again, they will be password protected on our computer for the front desk to print out for emergency purposes only. And also, if you have any medical equipment like oxygen, maybe a CPAP machine that you use, you need to make sure you mark it appropriately on here because again, during hurricane season, if we have a hurricane approaching, we like to make sure we know who's on oxygen, who needs help, if you have medication that's refrigerated, who do we need to respond to if the power goes out first if you're on oxygen. <coughs> Any questions? All right, thank you. Hand back over to Brandt. All right, thank you. All right, we're going to... Uh, uh, first slide. So success depends upon previous preparation, and without such preparation, there is sure to be failure. And that's uh, Confucius, and uh, so it's the point of uh, looking at June is the month of our preparation. So who knows when the hurricane season runs? June starts, starts June 1st and runs through? November. End, end of November. Uh, we always do the preparation starting in June because even though that's the start of the hurricane season, we never have any hurricane activity, uh, at least in Florida, in the early part of June. So this is our opportunity to go through the process and, and start the review process. Next slide. Uh, here is uh, essentially what we are looking at, and I brought a couple of, uh, of the emergency manuals. This is volume one and volume two. One was not enough. And, and so what I wanted to emphasize is just the, the nature of the planning. This is a pretty extensive uh, plan. We are not only looking at hurricane preparedness, but we are also looking at other natural disasters, other emergency situations. We're looking at floods, hail, uh, thunders, uh, heavy thunderstorms, tornadoes. For the first time, 
We also have added an emergency preparedness plan for what? COVID. Pandemics, yes. <laughs> so we now have an emergency uh, plan for how we're going to deal with COVID. And it's putting that time in up front to make sure that we know what we're going to do, how we're going to respond, train our staff, make sure our supplies and resources are there to support our logistics. Uh, that's how we uh, execute against the plan if we ever get into a situation where we're required to do that. Grant, do we have one for forest fires? We do not have one for forest fires. We probably uh, could do a grass fire here in Florida. <laughs> but great question. In many of our communities out west, they absolutely have plans for, for forest fires. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about cyber attacks? Don, go back one, please. Cyber attacks, we do not currently have uh, an emergency plan for cyber attack, and that's because we have a closed encrypted network. Uh, now, it could possibly get into one of our support servers at a corporate office, but uh, there, is no in, there is no external connection to any of our computers. We have 52 uh, computers on campus that are part of our uh, operating network. There's no external connection to that. You can bring in malware if you go into a site that's uh, not an appropriate site, but there's a hacker doesn't have the ability to get into our system here because we're, we're basically we're so small. There's no server. Um, purpose of the emergency manual, it's threefold. Uh, to identify and establish a committee of representatives. And so these are individuals from all of our departments who we gather around a table, we review the policies, we go through our inventory, we make sure that the supplies we need are there, uh, and we all have an opportunity to, from a departmental perspective, share our uh, ideas on what we need to do for each department to be ready for, for an emergency. Uh, we review our protocol for maintaining communication with residents, family, and associates. This is an area that we've really worked on for the past two or three years. And as we go through today, I'm going to talk about some of the highlights there of how we've improved our ability to communicate with you uh, during an emergency. And so uh, that's something uh, that we've focused on and we've actually added to this year as well. And then uh, to provide support venue for community staff to help in coordinating the logistic needs uh, if we are affected by an emergency. Next, next slide. So here is uh, what Colorado State University is uh, saying. This is the uh, go-to experts. I've never figured out why someone in the middle of the country is the go-to expert for dealing with hurricanes, but these are the uh, uh, people who are recognized as the best in the industry. Uh, they are saying uh, we are in 21, we're expecting 17 named storms, eight hurricanes uh, where our average has been six, and our major hurricanes are going to be four. Uh, this is, uh, there are two types of uh, systems. There's uh, La Nina and then there is uh, La Nina, uh, and this is more of a La Nina type of environment. So what that means is even though our uh, hurricanes are still only two above average, look at, look at this. Um, our hurricane days are going to jump from 58 to 80. And so that's a pretty significant increase. Uh, so that somewhere in the continental United States during our hurricane season, we're going to have nearly 80 days, that's almost three months, where a hurricane is threatening uh, a coastal area somewhere in the United States. So that's a pretty significant change uh, and something that we're going to, to have to track. All right, next slide. Here are the uh, storm categories. And we're going to talk about that for uh, just a minute. One last thing I did want to uh, share. Uh, I always think this is fun. Here are the named hurricanes in order uh, for 21. And as you probably know, they go back and forth, uh, female, male, female, male. Uh, it's Anna, Bill, Claudette, 
Danny, Elsa, Fred, Grace, Henry, and Ida. So those are the uh, first 10 storms of this year. And all of these storms are categorized into different wind, wind speeds. So a category, uh, I wanna look first at a category one and two. Uh, category one and two is winds not exceeding 100 miles an hour or a storm surge in excess of six to eight feet. Regency Oaks is designed to withstand a category one and two hurricane without any major disruption. Our roof is going to hold, our windows are going to hold, we'll get some uh, trees that are going to blow around, uh, we'll have some minor damage, but a category one or category two storm, Regency Oaks is designed to withstand. We do not recommend that you evacuate in a category one or two storm. We believe that we have the manpower, the resources, and the uh, support both at a corporate level and at a local community level to uh, get through a level one or two storm without any issues. A level three and a level four storm are winds up to 155 miles an hour and a little bit more of a storm surge. We have the ability to withstand a level three and level four uh, storm. You will have options, and we'll talk about those options. Uh, but Regency Oaks will withstand uh, winds up to 155 miles an hour. One of the things that has changed this uh, past couple of years that is different than it used to be for any of our old timers is a Category 5 storm. Used to be that Regency Oaks, the decision to evacuate or not, was made by Regency Oaks in support with uh, LCS, the ownership group. They made that actual decision. We still have that availability to make that decision for a level one through four, but the state, uh, and this is pretty much true for states across the country, they've now made the decision that if you have a, a level five storm headed into a coastal area, uh, the evacuation order is going to be given by the governor. So we no longer have the ability to ride out a level five storm here at Regency Oak. So that's a change in what you may have uh, heard me say three years ago. Uh, the state and the uh, weather officials have just made the decision that you have to be out of your mind. Uh, to try to ride out a level five storm. So that has changed some of our planning as well as we, as we get further into this. Next slide. Uh, there's heightened sensitivity after uh, Harvey, Irma, wildfires and tornadoes and families and residents and associates, they wanna know that we're ready. And that's the start of, of our uh, uh, process right now. Next slide. Here's our focus in May and June. We review the entire emergency manual. Uh, we complete the steps uh, to prepare for an emergency, no notice and notice. And so there's a difference as you plan for these emergencies. When you have a hurricane, uh, we have plenty of notice. It's not gonna just show up in the Gulf. We're going to have five, six, seven days uh, to track it, to watch it, to see how it develops, to be able to project its path, and to take appropriate steps. And so that the, one of the things that's great about hurricanes is they don't catch you by surprise. There are other emergencies where you don't get notice, where you have a fire, uh, where you have a tornado, uh, where you have a, 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 a spill, uh, a, tr a freight train, or a truck heading up 19 has a, a chemical spill. So we have to make sure that we have contingency plans in place for both emergency, no notice, and for those emergencies that we are aware of and have advance notice. Uh, updating community specific uh, plan, uh, state and county regulatory requirements. So we, uh, this year, uh, we, last year, we did not have a member of Regency Oak sitting on the county preparedness board. 
This year we do. It last uh, year before last it was George. This year it's Kyle, uh, and he sits in with the emergency management board. Uh, so we have good and valuable information. The independent living plan is not required to be certified, uh, and that's true of all independent living communities. Our assisted living and skilled nursing communities, those plans have to be approved by the emergency authorities. However, independent living follows the exact format of the county. So our plans, if they were to be required to be certified, they would meet the qualification. Uh, we keep residents updated in the billing system. That's really important uh, during the uh, hurricane season is to make sure we not only have your address, but your next of kin, uh, your relationships, and that's part of why Leslie is uh, focusing uh, on that information as well. We host staff meetings to discuss the emergency plan. We maintain our staff rosters. Uh, with current uh, contact information, phones, and addresses. We create our staff teams, and then we host our resident and family meetings uh, before July 1st. And so that's uh, what we're doing here today. Next slide. Emergency uh, preparedness. Uh, there are uh, essentially three steps. Prepare and plan for the potential disaster communicate those plans and responsibilities to the residents and to the associates, uh, and then communicate with the divisional and regional teams in terms of what we need in terms of support. So just as I'm having this meeting with you, uh, LCS is also having meetings with me and the other executive directors to talk about how they best can support us. Uh, just like Brookdale, uh, in the event of a storm, we will have air-conditioned uh, units sitting on trucks and rest stops pre-positioned throughout the state. We'll have 18-wheelers uh, with tarps and lumber uh, and uh, roofing material pre-positioned throughout the state so that if we have uh, an emergency and we need immediate response, we have resources that are ready once the storm has passed and the roads have cleared uh, we're going to be able to get an immediate response. And so that's one of the advantages of being part of a large organization is they have the resources to back us up and support us and make sure that uh, we're going to get the uh, support and response we need. Fellow my own shoe, shoelace, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> All right, next slide. Here's our emergency communication uh, plan. So we're updating the contact information. We are creating a family distribution list. Uh, and this is what we will use in the event of an emergency to communicate with uh, our families, uh, because that's always something that uh, our, we know our families are inquiring about. First thing that's gonna go down is the phones, right? And so we need to be at, we need to have a way to if your families are calling and saying, gosh, what's happening with mom and dad? Can you give us an update? They won't be able to do it over the phone. So we uh, create a, a distribution list for emails. Yeah. A lot of people nowadays don't even have a landline anymore. They rely on their cell phones. So if this goes on for any period of time, they're going to run out of power for their cell phones, too. Yeah. Have we got any backup plan for the way well, we so, are? Yeah, and so that's not really the issue. We will have a cell phone charging station that's on our emergency generator, but you're, if, if um, that, you're the very first thing that's going to go is the cell phone towers uh, because they are not designed to withstand a 100 mile an hour wind, let alone anything stronger. And so cell phones, our experience in, in the, the hurricanes that we've been through, not just here, but across uh, you know, in Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi where we operate, uh, the cell phone towers are always the first thing that, that goes. And so our backup is we have uh, satellite phones and so that we never will lose the ability to have limited communication one-on-one uh, -on -one with support services. So I'll be able to call our office, our corporate office in Des Moines using a satellite phone. Uh, but that's one of the things we'll, we'll talk about later. Don't count on your cell phone. It's very likely not going to be available. 
We do have charging stations that will be out and available, uh, but it's, uh, it's only going to help you if the cell phones are, are up and running. In the past, years ago anyway, one of the best communication systems that was available in a disaster were ham radio operators. And do we have any of them here? I do not know of a single ham radio operator. Does anyone? Well, I'm a licensed one, but I gave away all my equipment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, that's that's true. Um, so uh, maintain current contact information, list of phone numbers for all of our associates. It's just a building on our communication plan. Next slide. Uh, our primary source of communication is what we call the newsroom crisis page. Uh, it will be activated in the event of a severe emergency. It is not maintained here. It is off-site. It will be uh, posted out of our Des Moines office by our IT department. Uh, we will be providing updated information. And this is more uh, for your family members and friends who may be in, in uh, Nebraska who want to know how you're doing. They will be able to go to this uh, newsroom crisis page and look up at the daily updates, hourly updates, depending upon the conditions of what's happening at Regency Oaks and what the status of the building and the storm is. And so that's primarily for friends and family outside of the immediate uh, uh, area of concern that they'll be able to check. And then I, on an hourly basis, and in, in, right in the heat of it, will be uh, calling in and giving an update which someone will type and post uh, onto the crisis page. Uh, will the local call all work during the, that emergency? Yeah. So next, next thing is uh, the call them all service and we will use the call them all service. Now here's the limitations on the call them all. I will be able to communicate to you because my phones are on the emergency generators. Your phones are not. And so you may or may not be able to get a communication from me. If, if I'm communicating to your cell phone and, your, and the cell tower is down, you won't get that communication. If I am communicating to you on a phone, a landline, that has a main base and multiple extensions, that's battery driven and I will not be able to communicate with you. If you have a landline that is plugged directly into the uh, phone jack and it's like the old princess phone, you will get my message. And so the answer depends on what type of equipment you have on your end because my phone system is gonna be tied to the emergency generator. Make sense? Okay. Uh, and then we will also have a resident family uh, connection line uh, that will again be manned off-site uh, where a family or a friend who wants to uh, gather specific information, I'm checking on my mom, she has uh, health concerns, she's on oxygen, I need to know that she's okay, uh, can next time you speak to someone at the community, can you ask for an update? and we'll be able to uh, give that specific information back. Next slide. Here's the uh, emergency manual format. Uh, and it's, uh, I, on this slide, this is what I usually comment on, is we stole this from the military. Uh, and it's, we have a checklist uh, for everything. And so I, I literally feel like, you know, that sergeant, uh, uh, who has a, a disaster and he grabs a manual off the shelf and he flips over to the page and he starts at the top of the checklist and goes down until everything is completed. That's the same philosophy we used in, in developing our uh, preparedness plan is that there's a checklist for everything. And we open the book, we follow the checklist and that's how we execute uh, against the plan. Next page. Regency Oaks preparing for a hurricane. So here's our uh, highlights of our specific plan. Next page. So timeline for storm planning is really, really important because there are times where you should make decisions and uh, times uh, that are, are 
where you shouldn't make decisions. Awareness, this is how we've broken it down. 72 hours before landfall is, a, is awareness. Uh, that's where you ought to be tracking the storm. Can you determine what direction it's going? We will start posting the bulletins uh, down in the front lobby. We will post it on 732. Uh, that will give you our analysis. Uh, you should start watching Bay News 9 round the clock or <laughs> and uh, start buying into all the hype. Uh, but that's what happens in the awareness stage. In the standby stage, that's about 60 hours before the storm. At that point, we have a pretty good indicator of where we think that storm is going to go. And we're gonna start the preparation across campus based upon the strength of the storm. Uh, that's where we start buttoning down the hatches, putting plywood on our glass uh, sheets, uh, removing or tying down outdoor furniture. We may or may not uh, come and empty the furniture or electronics off of your apartment lanai's. Uh, that's when that process starts. The decision making right here, 48 to 36 hours, this is when you have to make the decision. And we'll talk about the decision. But just right now, I want you to remember 48 hours uh, is when you have to start making that decision. Implementation is that last 36 to 24 hours. Uh, and that's where we're making sure that the uh, generators are topped off, that all the supplies are in place, uh, that the batteries and emergency supplies and the lanterns have been pre-distributed, -distribu that the water bladders are completely full. Uh, that's the make or break period. We already know at that point that it's coming, it's going to hit us, and we're making the final preparations to make sure that we can get through the storm. Landfall is uh, waiting for it. Uh, when we move to landfall, we will have gone to our different staffing patterns. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then uh, the after action, uh, which can be up to seven days. And, and again, we'll talk more about that. So uh, here's uh, uh, human resources. Uh, here's the way we approach this. We break our staffing patterns down into three teams. Uh, there's team A, which is the primary team. I am the captain of the primary team. There is our relief team, which is team B. Uh, Darwin is the captain of the relief team. And then there is the backup team that is sleeping uh, uh, when the other two teams are, are picking up their shifts. And uh, uh, John Staniford, our director of security, is the captain of our third team. And so the single most important thing that you can do is once we get everyone here and we're in that uh, awaiting landfall of the storm, uh, we have to start getting the staff cycled onto three different shifts because uh, it's going to be a long process. We're the only ones who are going to be here uh, and we have to rely on what we have. And so we can't work everyone 24 seven and we can't work everyone on day shift. So we break it down into a day shift, a swing shift, and a, a night shift. Uh, and that's our, that's our approach on that. Um, we will have, one more thing I'll mention up there, we will have a partner assigned to us from uh, LCS. Now, it may or may not be our regional vice president. Uh, if we have a storm that's coming into Pinellas County, we're not the only ones at risk. Uh, we have Freedom Square, Lake Seminole Square, Leesburg, Bradenton, Sun City, and so our RVP may not be supporting us, but we will have a corporate associate, uh, whether it's Chris Berg or Angie Akey or one of our, our regional support who is specifically assigned to Regency Oaks, and their job is to blow away the obstacles so that if I need something, uh, I can go to this person and have them work on that while we continue to focus at the community level on making sure that we keep people safe and we protect property. Next slide. Uh, so preparing for an emergency, no notice. Uh, we, I've covered some of that. Let's just go to the next slide. Evacuation, okay. So now we gotta make um, the decision on uh, 
what you're going to do. And before you make that decision, there are three slides that I need to share because I want you to have all the information you need to make that decision. Resident evacuation plan, we do have one. And so if we have to evacuate here uh, and because the state comes in and, and orders an evacuation, we have buses, our own uh, sister communities and third party contractual buses. Uh, so we do have an evacuation plan. You're not able to take much with you on an evacuation plan. So you're not going to be able to take the family silver. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you may be able to bring your husband. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's a limited amount that you're going to be able to take with you in an evacuation. So that's the first thing I want you to know. If you do evacuate, we are not able to accommodate scooters. And so that's part of why we do that, in fact, why we do the list of individuals who are, have ambulation challenges, who are on oxygen, who have unique and special meds uh, or mobility issues. We have to address those well before the evacuation decision because we know that these contractual buses are not going to have the ability to accommodate uh, wheelchairs. So, what's, just what's BKT? That's Brookdale. That's that's one of the Brookdales that you need to ignore. <laughs> so, so all I'm saying is just as, as the second thing I want you to consider is if you are relying on oxygen or a wheelchair or a mobility device, you can not plan on waiting till the last minute and getting on a bus. They won't be able to accommodate you. You require a little extra attention and you have to make that decision in the 48 hour area as opposed to the 36 hour area. Make sense? Um, and then your IL resident hurricane emergency supply list, which we're going to go over. Next slide. This is really important. You need to know this. So the higher the elevation in terms of the building, the higher the wind. And so people who live on the fifth floor are going to get more wind than people who live on the first floor. Our evacuation plan says that all fourth and fifth floor residents must evacuate to the uh, first three floors. So if you live on the fourth or fifth floor and that hurricane is coming, we're gonna take you out of your apartment even if you have storm-proof windows we're going to take you out of that apartment and put you in a corridor for maybe three to four hours before the storm, during the storm, and a couple of hours after the storm, depending upon uh, the damage that's inflicted. So if you live on the fourth or fifth floor, know that you're going to be out of your apartment in a hallway for up to eight hours uh, without lights, without restrooms, uh, so I just want you to know that as you start making this decision. All right, next slide. Okay, uh, this is this is why um, you know there are flying projectiles in hallways, and you know we uh, we're uh, next slide. That's all right. So now. Here are the two options, so this is the decision that you have to make. Uh, select either plan. We don't have a preference. Well, I do have a preference, but you have two plans. First option. First option is to get out. <laughs> this is always the option I recommend if, if you have a, a niece, a daughter who lives in Atlanta, a cousin who lives in Atlanta, a uh, family member that lives in Jacksonville, and you have the opportunity to get out, to go somewhere, to ride out the storm in complete comfort and safety, that is always the best choice, uh, and it's what we recommend. We've sort of gone through the hurricane strength. We know that, you know, hurricane level one and two, uh, you can you can ride it out right here those winds are less than 100 miles an hour we don't think you need to do anything make sure you leave early enough because the last storm we left 
we got up to Hudson and the lines for gas were so long we turned around and came home. Yeah. You got to leave early. You got to leave early. 48 hours. Uh, that's, that's when you need to make the decision to pick up your bag and get out uh, or you're pretty much going to be stuck. So that's the, the first thing. Plan two is to stay. Now, here is my take on, on staying. Regency Oaks is a really safe building. We're 85 feet above sea level. We're the tallest point in Pinellas County. You live on a virtual mountaintop. This is a solid concrete building with a solid concrete roof. This building isn't going anywhere. This building will absolutely survive a Category 5 direct hit hurricane. But we're going to lose every window and we're going to have tons of water. That it's a, it's not in, you're not going to die, but next slide. <laughs> oh yeah, there's that. All the essential services provided by the local companies are not going to be here. You're not going to have power. You're not going to have air conditioner. You're not going to uh, have lights. Uh, you're not going to be able to run a fan. You're going to be stuck in a wet, damp, hot, humidity, humidity ridden apartment in the dark by yourself with limited services. You will not die, but you are not going to be comfortable. And so it's important that you consider that because I want you to know the environmental conditions that you're going to survive in uh, before you make that decision. Again, hurricane level one to two, up to 100 miles an hour, our building is gonna survive, we're gonna be fine. We've got emergency generators, I've got contracts uh, to bring in support services if we need them. Yes, there will be some trees that are blown down. The roadways may not be passable for a day. But if it's a category four storm and it's a direct hit, the roads may not be passable for a week. And so that's the difference. As you, as you think about this, you, we may be isolated for up to seven days. I have seven days worth of food. I have seven days worth of an emergency generator and diesel to support it. I have staffing for seven days. You will not die, <laughs> but you will not be comfortable. It will be, it will be a survival issue. All right. So here's a, a question that also is really important as you start to make this decision. What's on the emergency generator? I do have some limited lighting in the hallways, the lobby areas, the stairwells, the dining rooms, and some exterior lighting, uh, odds and ends. All the, ele all the elevators in all resident areas are on the emergency generator. So you're not gonna be stuck on a floor. We're gonna be able to uh, evacuate uh, and you'll be able to move around within the building. Uh, our fire alarm panel is on the emergency generator, as are our phones, business phones, our emergency call bell system. So our safety, our basic life safety systems are all on the emergency generator. Uh, if we have a fire in the middle of a hurricane, it's on the emergency generator. Our suppression system, our uh, alert system, all of that works because it's on the emergency generator. Uh, food service. Our food service is uh, on the emergency generator. We have backup gas. We have backup power from uh, the uh, electrical from the generator. So we will be able to put out food. Uh, we have a limited amount of power at the front desk. Uh, and then uh, a triage apartment. We will create a triage apartment with uh, portable air conditioning. But it's one apartment maybe one per building uh, based upon you know how much time we have and, and what level of the storm. Uh, but it's one apartment that is primarily going to be used for those individuals with compromised uh, health situations who need oxygen, who might be having palpitations because they've been in a hot human environment for 28 hours and, and they're beginning to have cardiac issues. 
but I can get 10 people at a time in there. I can't get 456 people in there. So take that into consideration as you make your decision. What is not on the emergency power at Regency Oaks? Your apartment. That's, that's the thing you need to know. Nothing in your apartment is on the emergency power grid. So anything that you're not getting up and making a pot of coffee in the morning, uh, you can't make hot water, uh, your coffee pot isn't going to work, your toilet will still flush, maybe, uh, but you're not on the power grid. Next slide. Uh, prepare a grab and go case. This is always something we think is important. Be sure you put in there a birth certificate, social security card, your uh, prescriptions, your doctors, your driver's license, emergency cash. ATM machines are not going to be working. You should have this ready to go so that uh, as, you, as we approach the decision phase, which is 48 hours before landfall, your focus can be on making the go, no go decision, not on trying to pack a bag at the last minute when you're under stress and, and when you know I'm hurrying you along and saying, look, you gotta make this decision, let's go. Um, have it ready to go, have it prepared, have it uh, uh, easy access so you can just grab and go. Make a contact list. Uh, you know, you may be out of your apartment for six months. If uh, that's what happened when our sister community, Southport Square, got hit by Hurricane Charlie, uh, that community was evacuated for six months. Uh, residents uh, lived in a hotel in downtown Tampa. Um, and we bust them up from Charlotte, and they were in that hotel for six months as they. Uh, replaced all the windows, replaced all the drywall, replaced all the finishes at Southport Square. So you don't think about this uh, when right in the middle of the disaster, but if the worst happens, you're gonna be out of your home for six months. You're not gonna be allowed back in. The fire marshal will shut this building down. Any of your family possessions uh, will, if, if what remains, uh, They'll, you know, they, what they did at Southport Square is they tried to collect what they could uh, and everybody got a box, but you know, it's make sure that you're taking what you need to survive uh, if, if uh, you're doing a grab and go. Next page. Prepare a house sort of inventory. If, uh, again, if the worst happens and you have to have a settlement with your insurance company, what we recommend is that you videotape your apartment. It is so hard. You know, 30 days after the fact, uh, you'll be sitting down with your adjuster and say, well, what'd you have in the living room? Well, I don't know. I had a TV. Yeah. I had a sofa. <laughs> you'll, you'll miss it. So if you just videotape it, that's the best way we found to come up with an inventory list. All right. I think that's it. One other thing and then we're just going to uh, open it up for, for questions. There is, you can just come back on me. So there is a, one of these, it's a handout, it's uh, you uh, have them available over here at the desk as you go out. Uh, you also will be able to get this at the front desk. Um, this is, uh, I've been using this since uh, uh, 2006 so I have lots of good notes. Um, but this will uh, give you a list of the recommended hurricane list for your uh, for what you need to provide um, and the two things so look at this list water that's two things that are really important water our recommendation is you need six gallons of water per person per day and you need three gallons for sanitation and three gallons for personal hygiene and cooking. So that's six gallons of water uh, for, two, uh, for one person for every day. That's a lot of water. And so there are multiple ways that you can get water. You can put water uh, in your bathtub. These are the only stoppers that we have seen that work. 
There are some that fit into the, uh, the hole. Those things we have found do not work. This is the only thing of all of our experience uh, that we have found that works. Uh, we, is, we will make all of this stuff available to you. We'll uh, provide it to you at cost. There's a sign-up sheet at the north and south desk. We will get it. We will bring it in. We, you can just write us a check or we can add it to your monthly service fee. We will absolutely give you a, a brand name if you prefer to get one yourself. But this is the only thing that we have found in the, your bathtub is your primary water source uh, during an uh, emergency. If you do not have a bathtub, you, your apartment only has showers, uh, then you're going to have to invest in something like this. This is a water bladder. The great thing about these is you can stick four of them under your bed and you have 20 gallons of water. Uh, they are sanitary. They, you don't have to worry about dust. They're completely sealed. They are easy to store. Uh, you use them and you throw them away. They're very inexpensive. So think about your water supply. My water supply, my backup water supply is the boilers. Uh, I've got 500 gallon boilers uh, throughout the campus, three per building. And then I have uh, uh, 34,000 gallons of water in the pool. So that's my backup water supply. So you'll need to think about a, a backup water supply as well. Where do you find those? Uh, again, this will be available at the front desk if you want to, to buy one. Um, and you just sign up for any of the supplies that you'd like to, to purchase. We will get them to you again at cost. Uh, but you uh, also uh, can get all of this from Home Depot. You can get it online. Simplest thing to do is buy it from, from us and, and uh, the prices are good. Two things that I want to talk about for uh, lighting. Lighting is the single most important thing that you are going to need. Your apartment is going to be pitch dark. And every year this happens. Uh, we, we lose power and the resident says, well, I just, I had a flashlight and I had eight extra batteries. They, they were brand new. They were in a, a container. I put them in and the, the batteries only lasted about 30 minutes. Well, how old were those batteries? Well, I think they were probably in that drawer for 10 years. So, <laughs> so batteries that are brand new and are at five years old, they're no good. They will immediately give you power, but they don't have any, they, they, they can't sustain the, the, the ramp up. So fresh batteries is critical, fresh batteries every two years. And then the second thing is we highly recommend uh, a flashlight is great, particularly if you're going down a, a, a corridor or trying to get somewhere. But if you're sitting up in there in that apartment, your TV doesn't work, your radio doesn't work, and you can't get any music because you know your cell phone is down and you, you can't stream, and so you're stuck reading a book or you're just stuck having a conversation with uh, your, your wife, uh, turn on some light. <laughs> and you don't want to be doing that with a flashlight. So these are the three essentials that we recommend for every single uh, resident. I also have provided uh, really good information about sanitizing uh, your tub water. Your tub water needs to be sanitized. You use bleach. Uh, it's a quarter cup per tub. Those tubs are 40 gallons. Uh, and so there are directions on how to use that as a sanitizer. Um, one last thing, I just always uh, share this. Uh, our backup gas plan is you. <laughs> so our associates uh, are coming and going. One of the first things that happens in a storm is there's no longer gasoline. And so to keep uh, my associates going, they're going home to take care of their families. Uh, they're coming back into work. They can't get gasoline and we know that they probably aren't going to be able to get gasoline. So our backup plan is to buy gasoline from you. And so we know that everybody goes and fills up their car uh, when there's a storm. I have about 190 cars on campus uh, that belong to residents. They're all full of gas. And I don't want to, uh, and so our plan is we won't deplete you. If you've got 20 gallons worth of gas in your car, we'll ask to buy five gallons and I'll pay you a premium 
uh, but I'll go siphon off, with your permission uh, and with a check, uh, we'll siphon off gas from your car to keep our associates going. Uh, because that's the that's the one area that uh, potentially, you know, again, supplies and resources are limited in uh, a plan, and so that's uh, what we came up with to make sure that the staff that we all depend on will be able to get to and from work is uh, by buying gasoline from our residents. And the roads are blocked, so you may not be able to go. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, everything on my presentation. I'm going to open it up for uh, any questions that uh, anyone has. And Tiffany, the Tiffany is coming with mics. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Pets. Yes, so uh, pets evacuate with their owners. Uh, we, as part of our emergency plan, we have almost 500 pounds of dog food uh, and cat food. So uh, we have provided emergency supplies for our pets, uh, and pets will evacuate with you uh, in the event of an evacuation. So we, don't, we won't take your wheelchair, but we'll take your, your cat or your dog. <laughs> Will we get a handout of, of the uh, presentation that has all the information on it? Um, no, but if you, um, how do we do that? Is it, is it post, anyone, Jean, where do you know that? Where, how do I, how do we post this? It's in the libraries? Um, it will be in the libraries. All the town hall meeting presentations are in three ring binders in each of the libraries for you to read in the library, not to take with you. What's so, the handout we're getting, though? Your so handout is yeah. going to be the, um, the checklist, the preparation. So you're getting some key yeah. information. You're getting a, uh, what you need to know if you in making your decision. You're getting a list of the hurricane <coughs> supply list for residents. You're getting a list of what's on the emergency generator. You're getting a list of our food service plan and your uh, grab-and-go contact list and household inventory. So everyone is going to get one of these, and then if you want a full copy of the uh, presentation, it's available in both libraries. Or they can tape it. Or they can tape it. Yeah, this is also available on YouTube, so you'll be able to download it. And if you really, really want a copy, come see me. What else? The pizza oven going to work? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's wood fired, right? <laughs> this is information some of you might be interested in. We were surprised to find it out the last time. Uh, if you have grandchildren in the area, uh, we have one. They live over near the intercoastal waterway in Dunedin. If there is an evacuation order, they have to be evacuated or the parents can be charged with child endangerment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very true. Yeah. So, so here's the here's the uh, what we'll talk about that briefly. Anyone who was here for Irma knows that we had about 500 additional people here that we were housing, uh, and they were sisters of some of our residents. It was all the family members of our staff, uh, people who had been uh, in evacuation areas and didn't have anywhere to go. And so we accommodate individuals uh, in our emergency plan. I don't keep food for, for 600 people, I keep food for 1,200 people. And so I can accommodate people and I would rather have your friends and family members in your apartment or in a corridor as opposed to being in a shelter somewhere. And so, but what we do ask is they have to be registered so that we will be able to know how many meals to cook, where they are, so that if the worst happens, we know who's in the building and we're not uh, everybody evacuated and leaving 20 people behind that we didn't even know were in the building. So that is something we will do, but we, we do ask that you register your family members and guests 
uh, in the event of an emergency. Here's I got a question. question back there. Yeah, some of us who have uh, spouses in the uh, Sylvan Center, what is the uh, procedure for that? So, coordination of <laughs> spouses. Yeah, and so, um, Great question, and so sort of the same uh, answer. Sylvan is prepared just like we are. They are a part of our planning process. Uh, what we don't want is in that period, uh, 24 hours before and 24 hours after, we don't want you going back and forth. And so what we would say is choose where you want to be um, and, and then stay there. And so we accommodate spouses in the nursing home, but we don't accommodate nursing home spouses in the IL. So you may choose to spend that 48 hour period over in, in the health center that, that, or, or not. But we just don't want you going back and forth in the middle of the storm. We want you to be safe. <laughs> right here. Right. Now, other interesting thing is we have lots of air conditioned space over in the skilled nursing uh, that we don't have here in the IL. What else? Their whole building is on. Uh, Not the whole air. building, but they have a lot more air conditioned space in than what we do. So they can get you into a cool room for four hours and then back into your uh, uh, resident unit and then back into the cool room so they, they're much better prepared. And it's simply because of size. Yeah. This is sort of a dumb question. Wait, Probably. wait, wait, wait. I'll skip that part. Anyway, I assume that we're not allowed to use Coleman lanterns? It, that was, that's correct. And so the question is, I, we assume we're not allowed to use Coleman lanterns. And so that's probably not a, a good idea. Yeah. We ought to have a show and tell about the different things that are available. Like for example, this little light I have here, it's magnetic, you can put it on your- Hold on Earl, we're gonna, let's, let's make sure everyone sees this. Can we get Tiffany, can we get this show and tell? Mm -hmm. Hold on Earl, we're gonna put this on show and tell. So and it's magnetic. You can put it on your refrigerator, you can put it on your uh, file cabinet, any place that's magnetic that you can do it. And then it has a light that you touch like this. You get this on and then a little bit louder. A little bit closer. Pardon? The, just the mic a little bit closer. A little bit closer. There you go. But that's basically what it is. Just this and this. But then you turn it off and uh, you go whenever you need it. It's there. So it's in a different place. Pardon? Uh, I think most of the time you can buy these either at uh, uh, Costco or on uh, Amazon. Most of my stuff I get from Amazon. What's it called though? What's the name of the battery operator? Uh, I'm not too sure there's a name on it. But uh, what's, what's the, I'll try uh, to find out for you. And I'll, uh, all these things that I have that I use, uh, I'll let you know about it. Like a little sheet of paper I'll give to Brandt and he can print it out. Or what's you can what's the life of, of one of those? Well, I imagine as long as you need the batteries and you have to replace the batteries from time to time, there's three uh, AA batteries in here. But if you have significant batteries, this will let You're not going to be burning it all the time. But if you have to go to some place, uh, to the ice box, or you have to go to get into your uh, uh, file cabinet, or any place else that you have this. I have little ones that I have inside of my small uh, closet, and also I have one inside of my big closet. It's a little bigger one. But you just put them up on the wall. This is not the same as this. But you can put them up there, or stick them, stick them up there, and you just touch them. But there are, well, let me just kind of explain how I looked at the things years ago. I have a Mylan Eye, a portable solar panel. Portable what? Solar panel. Solar panel. Solar panel. Oh, hold the mic. Okay, a solar panel. And uh, on that, it's all on, uh, like a cart. So I can move it any place I want to move it. And it has a, what they call a controller, 
and batteries and an inverter. So what I can do is invert my DC that I catch from the solar and the batteries to AC. And in fact, I brought it down one time when the power went out and nobody had anything down here. And I, uh, excuse me, I gave it to, I think it was Bob that was working the desk so he can plug his computer in and talk to people with, or doing whatever he had to do with that computer. But that's just who I am. But there's little things that you can all do in your apartment. And these are some of the things you can do. We need to have solar here as backup. But uh, I've been after that for about eight years. So anyway, that's all I have. Any other last questions? All right. I hope you got good information. Thank you for, uh, for staying.